And I told her early on, I knew she was the one. I told her early on, I said, I want to look up in the stands and see you after winning an NBA championship. Wow. And I was able to do that. Welcome to Sports Spectrum, keeping Jesus in the sports conversation. Here's your host for today's show, former ESPN producer, Jason Romano. He is Ryan Saunders with the Denver Nuggets. Hey, Ryan, what's up? Welcome to Sports Spectrum. How you doing? I'm good, man. It's good to see you on Zoom. Well. I mean, we saw each other in person, I guess it was a little while ago, a few weeks ago, yep. a few months ago, yep. um, at the Christians Working in Sports Conference out in Minneapolis. But uh, it's good to see you in person, man. I got to start with uh, being an NBA champion. I think yeah. that's probably the question that everybody asks when they see <laughs> you or come in contact with you. But has it sunk in yet what this past season was like and certainly calling yeah. with a championship. Yeah, well, first off, Jay, I appreciate you having me on. It's, it's, uh, I'm looking forward to talking a little bit and, and seeing where the conversations go. And, yeah. and uh, yeah, you know, being an NBA champion, I mean, I, I feel like, you know, it's, it's relatively new, but whenever I've been introduced that way over the last uh, few months here, um, it, I feel like it's something that's never going to get old. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things, too, that, you know, it, <laughs> all of a sudden, you know, people – um, think you're a lot smarter than you might be, uh, you know, now, now, that, now that you have the NBA champion tag, tag on you, but it has sunk in a little bit in a sense of, um, you know, summer league, you go, from, you go from the NBA, um, NBA finals to the NBA draft, which is literally the next week, uh, was literally the next week for us. Then you go to NBA summer league, which was 10 days later for us. Um, so you don't really get to catch your breath, but then once you get to NBA summer league and you start seeing other NBA folks around, um, and, and you're able to, you know, kind of have those casual conversations about how your seasons seasons have gone. Um, you know, you, you it starts to sink in a little more. And uh, you know, I remember being on the other end of of some of those those conversations with you know guys from Golden State, guys from Milwaukee, guys from Toronto um, in years past, guys from Cleveland. Um, you know, and, and just kind of thinking like, wow, you know, hey, this what, what do we have to do to somehow get to that point? You know, in our careers. Uh, and, you know, now you're kind of there. Uh, so now it's just about trying to get another one. And uh, I think you – that's the crazy thing about the NBA calendar. It moves quickly uh, where, you know, you're done with that. You celebrate uh, a little bit or a lot of bit, uh, depending on, on where, where the, the days and weeks go. Um, and then you just try to move forward and, and try to do what you can to put your team in the best position um, next year. Yeah. I want to go back to game five, specifically mm -hmm. at the end. Because it was a close game, and there was moments yeah, where yeah. you know you're trying to get the right calls on the court, and you're trying to get the right, uh, just trying to see the clock go down to zero. It feels yeah. like in those games, especially in the playoffs, everything takes a little bit longer to get there. But then the clock actually ticks zero, and the confetti starts falling. Can, mm -hmm. Do you have a distinct memory of being on the court and, and celebrating in that moment? Um. Yeah. Kind of. You know. It's funny the the way you you described it was spot on because you know it, it was one of those games it wasn't where we were up you know 20 we weren't up you know 15 10 even down the stretch by any means you know we, we were fighting and clawing and you know that's a unbelievable unbelievably resilient Miami Heat team that you you knew that was going to be um, an extremely difficult game uh, but you know it, it's just a huge credit to this team and, and the makeup of the players that we've had uh, just the way they they were fighting so you know, it was it was a very um, it almost felt very uh, just business as usual type um, of a mindset within within the group. And during those timeouts where it felt like everybody knew what we needed to do, we just understood it was going to be very difficult. Then obviously the buzzer sounds and, you know, you feel like there's more there's got to be more time or there's something else you've been going for, you know, whatever, nine months Um it feels like there's something else, but then you, you kind of look up and you see the confetti start falling. Um, and, and you realize, you know, you, you kind of realize like, wow, this is, we did it. This is it. And then, and then they start passing out t-shirts and hats and you look and they say NBA champions. Um, and then you look up in the stands and, you know, I find my wife, I find my kids uh, who are four and two. And uh, you know, she, she did a masterful job uh, along with her mother 
uh, at that time of, of making it where they could let last through the game. They actually brought them at halftime on the off chance that we were able to close it out that game so we could all kind of share in that experience. Um, mm-hmm. So just looking up there and seeing them and, and seeing the kids looking up at the confetti and trying to grab at it, um, it, it was really, really special. Um, and then you look at all the other play, the players who have, who have wanted that for so long, other coaches, um, equipment manager, uh, Sparky Gonzalez, people who have been in the organization for so long and you see, you know, tears on some faces, you see just, you know, jubilation on some faces and uh, then, then it starts, starts hitting you a little more. Did you have a moment in the locker room before everything just turned crazy? Were you guys able to have that or is that just not possible when you win a championship? Yeah. Gosh, it, you know, it all kind of blends together and, and it was, you know, we're on, we're on the court where, you know, you're obviously celebrating they go through the trophy presentation um, they do all of that and, and then they kind of usher you back, you know, as they're kind of getting the locker room ready, um, you know, putting the, the, you know, plastic tarps up and trying to preserve some, some of, you know, <laughs> what's already in there, you know, with the yeah. champagne and everything. And then, you know, they kind of, you know, everybody just kind of goes back on their own at some point, um, you know, as they start trying to usher us back and, and then you get back there and there's champagne and everything lined up and, just just i mean it's just you haven't seen the locker room like that well we took a a little bit of a moment to go back to kind of our coach's office and we just quick kind of you know talk to celebrate it you know in in that sense you know congratulating each other um but then it was you know hey get to celebrating with everybody and uh so it was was just a lot of fun yeah it was a couple weeks after that that you and i connected in person at the christians Mm -hmm. working in sports conference our friend drew bow um, yep. And we talked about overcoming trials at that event, I think, when we were yeah. sharing with the crowd and you were up there with me. Um, we'll get to some of those trials in a yeah, bit yeah. shared. But this past season, you came out of a trial in many ways. So coming mm-hmm. out of the trial, just I'm talking about coaching, yeah. right? Coming out of that yeah. trial. What do you think that did to you in having the gratitude and appreciation for accomplishing a championship oh, yeah. certainly being a man of god as well and and, and oh yeah from a spiritual perspective that must have been really uh i just i guess an, a unique experience going through all that yeah well for, first off drew and the uncommon sports group you know they do an unbelievable job um yeah. with not just furthering you know christ's mess- message uh within the sports community but connecting people you know, and had that had not been for that conference, you and I, pro- you and I probably would not have been speaking right now. You know, True. just because we we didn't have that oppor- we wouldn't have had that opportunity to um, interact and get to know each other a little bit in, in that short period of time. So it's yeah. a big credit to, to to those folks over there. Um, but like you said, you know, I think I think we all deal with trials. I mean, that's that goes without saying. You know, everybody deals with trials, um, and you know, I think something that that you know has kind of stuck with me over time is that you know, trials can be big and small, you know, and look big and small to certain people. I've, I've had people come up to me and say, you know, I, I haven't been through, you know, something that you, you know, the, the level of trial that you've been through when they refer to, and I'm sure we'll talk at some point about, you know, losing my father, obviously in a very public way. Yeah. Um, and, and I always like to stop people and say, you know, I don't think that's fair, fair for you to say that because whatever trial you've been through, um, it was big in your, in your life, whatever it is this was just the biggest one in my life. So I don't think it's fair to compare trials. And I I say that where, you know, I think we need to celebrate whatever victory, you know, whether it is an NBA championship or it is, you know, Hey, getting back on your feet after, you know, losing a job, getting back on your feet after a relationship, you know, might, might falter, um, getting back on your feet, you know, after possibly, you know, you know, God forbid, you know, a death in your family or in your close circle, um, so, you know, just having, having gone through, I guess you could say when you look at, you know, a, a, a recent trial for myself was, you know, Hey, I'm no longer the coach of the Minnesota Timberwolves, a, a group, a team that, that has meant so much to me and my family through, throughout my, um, my life. Uh, you know, that was difficult, but I also understood that there was going to be a, there's a bigger plan through that. And I, I understood that patience was, and it wasn't easy. And I understood that patience was going to, um, be something that, if I could find a way to muster up enough patience um, and I guess give myself some grace in that time um, to help myself not only improve, but help myself to see the things that I felt I I did right in Minnesota. um, It was going to help me in my next stop. And I do help think it's helped me in my next 
you know, stop it being Denver in this journey. And um, it's just been a perfect situation for me. So for me, it, it was one of those moments that I was able to feel that, you know, cause I had some other opportunities that I really liked the year prior um, uh, in terms of, you know, going some, some other places and great, you know, job opportunities. Um, but they just didn't, for some reason, they didn't feel right. And that's a tough thing to, to say, you know, when you have these, jobs that, you know, as we're fortunate in the NBA to, you know, pay you a lot of money. Um, they're offering you a lot of money. They're offering you, you know, a job in the NBA, which is very hard to get. Um, for me to say, hey, it's not the right time for me. You know, I'm going to spend time and be a, be a husband, be a father, um, you know, be involved in my community here in Minnesota. Uh, you know, that was difficult, but, you know, I had to have patience, had to have trust uh, in the Lord and trust in the plan. Um, knowing that, you know, something great was coming and, you know, I knew something great was coming. I didn't know it was going to be this great. Uh, and, yeah. you know, being with the Denver Nuggets, being in a, at, in a place that my family really loves an organization that is very family um, involved. Um, and then also, you know, reaching the pinnacle of winning an NBA championship. Uh, so I, I feel very grateful for that. That's good stuff there. He is Ryan Saunders, Denver Nuggets assistant coach. He's joining us here on Sports Spectrum. We're the intersection of sports and faith, Ryan. Uh, we talked a lot about winning a title, and we'll get into some of the other trials and things that you've walked through in your journey. Uh, but I want to hear about your faith. I want to hear about your yeah. walk with Jesus and kind of when that became real to you. Yeah, um, you know, it, it's it's something that, um, you know, goes back probably like a lot of, a lot of folks um, – you know, to being raised in a Christian household. And, uh, you know, we were, I was raised in, in, in a home where we went to church. Um, we knew it was a big part of our lives. Um, you know, we also understood uh, that, you know, we had, I have three, three siblings. Um, it wasn't always every day where we were able to get to church. Um, you know, it, we, we didn't have that where, you know, we, we knew that, God wasn't, you know, just judging you based on your attendance. Um, he was ju judging you based on how you lived your life. And I think that was something my mom and dad um, did a great job of instilling in us, you know, having empathy, um, living your life with a purpose, um, being somebody that treated people with people with respect and also stood up for those that um, maybe were underserved um, as well as giving back to the community. So I, I think, you know, faith, whether I knew it at the time, it was a huge, huge part of how I was raised. Um, I didn't understand quite, you know, I knew it would be a part of my life, but I didn't understand quite what that meant um, until I got to college. I had a couple shoulder operations while playing at the University of Minnesota. And uh, I had a teammate, you know, during that time, I was in this a mobilizer that was really, really uncomfortable and kind of having a little bit of a difficult time. But um, I had a teammate, my uh would have been my fresh freshman year. Um, freshman year, uh, invite me to a church. Uh, it was called the Upper Room. Um, actually, it was at the same church that I ended up getting married at, which wow. is ironic because Upper Room is no longer there. It's <laughs> in, a, in a different space. But um, I ended up, we ended up getting married in that church. But I remember the song that was playing. I remember, you know, just kind of the whole mood, the whole whole moment of you know being there and you know feeling overcome knowing that okay hey I, this is a, a relationship it's not just something that is there you know for it's not just you know something for me to attend and yeah. then you boom you check a box this is a relationship and how you live your life and uh so it's kind of taken off from there and you know i'll be the first one to admit that i i am not a perfect christian by any means and i have a lot of things i need to improve upon but i also understand that i've, I've came a long way in, in a lot of ways um but, you know, I'm, I'm still a work in progress, which I'd like to think that everybody is, but some, some people may, may uh, feel differently. <laughs> well, Ryan, I haven't met a perfect Christian yet. We've done over a thousand <laughs> interviews on this show, so that works out well. Um, yeah. but what, do you remember the song? What, what song was playing when you walked into that church? Yeah, um, it's, uh, I remember the, the lyrics, uh, I, I'm desperate for you, were, okay. were, were, were the lyrics. Um, yes. And, uh, you know, I, I remember... Uh, exactly, you know, how it was being sung, you know, the woman that was singing it. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I want to say it's called I'm Just Before You. So, yeah, I, I know the song. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just became a Christian around those early 2000s, mid 2000 uh -huh. range. And I, I remember the song. Um, yeah, 
I'm lost without you. I'm desperate for yeah, you. Yeah, exactly, right. exactly. yeah, exactly, exactly. That's it. Yep, yep. Yeah. So powerful song. Yeah, it'll, you it'll, it'll just make you search your your own heart. But for you, as you said, it's a it's been you know a journey, if you will. And yeah, he's perfect. But what changed? Did you start to see? You know, as, as your basketball career started winding down, yeah. you went to the University of Minnesota. Yeah, yeah. You want to let people know yeah. that living in Minnesota, and obviously your dad is a coach, and you went into coaching pretty quickly. Yeah. Did you see a change just in in yeah in your life spiritually after that? I did. I did. I I, I saw a change. I saw a change in how I approached difficult si- situations. Mm. Um, how how and which you know little did I know it was going to prepare me for what I you know, was my most difficult trial, you know, you know, to date. And that's, you know, losing my father. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, so, you know, I think it was all just kind of build up, I guess, to prepare me for that type of moment and, and be there for those, those around me, you know, having my mother, having three younger sisters as well, you know, it's, uh, that's a lot. And, um, you know, but during that time too, and I'm sure we'll touch on it, but during that time, you know, I, we never lost faith. And that's something that I think was, uh, was really, really important, but also really special because, you know, I think it, it showed that, you know, we were, I was growing in our, in my relationship and we were growing in our relationship um, as Christians, as a family. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't mean you're not human either. And so you're not hurting. I mean, your dad, when yeah. everybody knew about your dad, he's a, a legend, obviously a longtime coach with, with Minnesota and other teams in the NBA, the Pistons. But when, when he finds out that, you know, he's sick and has this, this, yeah. cancer. it was pretty quick from the time yeah. we found out yeah. to the time that, yeah. that we lost them. Like, so yeah, is that, I'm just, you talk about pre- being prepared. I don't yeah. think anybody's ever prepared for a moment, no, like that. No. but it's, it's the sustaining is a word I think of. Did you feel that yeah. like it was able to sustain you in finding all this out and having to walk through it? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I do. I do feel that. And, you know, in the, in the time when we were in that hospital, um, you know, at the University of Minnesota, which was where he, you know, received a lot of the care after he did get sick. You know, it was, you know, he, he didn't die from the cancer. It was from complications, you know, during the treatment. Yeah. Um, you know, and and so that was where things kind of went south for us as a family. Um, but, you know, during that time uh, in the hospital, um, he was there for, I want to say, close to 40 days. You know, we kept it pretty quiet. It was something we 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 knew we kind of needed a miracle. We didn't want to have to be answering all these questions during that time. Um, answer the, you know, see the other, I guess, elements of what that, that could bring as he was at the time, you know, still the president of the Minnesota Timberwolves, still the head coach of the Minnesota Timberwolves. So there would have been a lot with that. So we didn't make it public. We only told a select number of people. Um, but in that time we were able to spend, spend a lot of moments with him, uh, in the hospital. And, uh, you know, some moments where it looked like, you know, it was the end. Um, and then, you know, he kind of pulls through, you know, we know he was able to hear us, even though if he wasn't responding to us, um, we know he was able to hear us. And, you know, that's, you know, I guess us demonstrating, demonstrating faith in that moment. Um, but it just allowed us to spend more time with him uh, there. And, um, you know, then it, you know, kind of happened. And that's kind of when I th- think it shook a lot of people. Yeah. Um you know, and in the sports world, but more partic- particularly in Minnesota. And, uh, you know, there were a lot of reminders of that throughout. And the support was was really incredible from people within Minnesota. But it was also something that um, was almost unescapable unes- at that time, which, you know, you want to escape too, but you also understand that people just want to help. Yeah. I met your dad, I want to say once or twice. He was at ESPN briefly, if I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was definitely there and we crossed paths a couple times, nothing too formal, just kind of a passing. Hi, how you doing? Glad you're yeah, here yeah. type of thing. Um, when you think about his legacy and, you know, you, mm-hmm. he, he was what, or you were 10 years old, I think, when he was coaching, yeah. 10 years old when he became the head coach. Yeah. Because yeah. right? I was thinking about that time and when Garnett came to Minnesota kind of with yeah. your dad and, and kind of built up a program that had been on its downtrodden for the first few years of its, of its existence. Um, yeah that's an interesting life to grow up into. And Mm -hmm. then when he passes, you're an assistant coach at the time, I think, right. If I'm doing my, my, my right. So there's a lot there in terms of this coaching legacy, you know, and I could ask you the question, what was, what was his impact on you? Like, it's clear that it's a big one, 
But what were some of your reflections when you thought about, you know, your dad after he had passed in terms of some of the, just a couple maybe nuggets that yeah. he, yeah. that he impressed upon you? Certainly being yeah. a man of faith, being the most important, I would imagine. Yeah. You know, there, there's two things that, that kind of come to mind and, and, you know, ironically, they don't, neither of them involve a basketball. Yeah. Um, you know, one, you know, and he had this saying that he always used, used to bring up and, you know, it's something that, you know, you, you hear it so many times, you don't think much of it. And then, you know, somebody, you lose somebody, they pass away. You can't, you know, talk to them, you know, in the physical form, you talk to them in other ways, you communicate with them in other ways. I'd like to believe, sure. but he, uh, he always used to say, he's like, your greatest, he'd say your greatest strength is your greatest weakness if you can't control it. And, you know, I, I didn't quite get that until I, you know, I think he, he passed and I was able to reflect on that even more. And, you know, and I, I say that in the sense of, I feel my, one of my greatest strengths is a care factor about yeah. anything, anything I do. I care about it. Um, and it just means a lot to me. And, you know, whether that be, I'm, I'm talking about no matter what, whether it be this podcast, whether it be, you know, right. coaching, no, no matter what it is, I, I just care, you know, about it. And um, if I can't control that, that care can over overtake you, you know, losses, you know, all those things that, you know, uh, you know, can come, come at you, you know, with caring so much. He used to use Kevin Garnett as an example. His greatest strength is his competitiveness. I think it was very clear that we, that we, you know, as fans and, and, you know, I always idolized Kevin growing up, yeah. um, you know, his competitiveness was so extreme, um, you know, and then as you get older, you see, you know, there are moments that, you know, hey, maybe you get to technical, you understand technicals are part of the game, but competitiveness maybe takes over and it becomes, quote, unquote, a weakness, if, if, if you want to put sure. it that way. Yeah. Um, so he used to use that as an example. So that was one thing. And then and then the other is, is a story that actually involves um, actually involves uh, the church we went to in, in, uh, in Plymouth, uh, Minnesota, growing up. And I remember I was in high school and uh, for some reason, I want to say my sisters and, and mother, they, they were at a dance competition or something. It was just me and him going to church that, that day. Hmm. And, uh, it was, it was across from, um, from a, a, uh, the church was across from, you know, an apartment complex and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a, uh, you know, l luxurious apartment complex, you know, whatever, whatever that may be. Sure. Um, so anyways, we go into church and we come out of church and his car was broken into window, window smashed, you know, door pride, pride open. Um, took took his, you know, he left his phone. He left a number of things in there. Um, yeah. you know, and, 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 you know, I see that and I'm, I'm mad. I'm, I'm like, how is that? Like, and he, he was unbelievably calm and I'll never forget how calm he was. And he, you know, I was, I was like, Hey, we got to figure this out. Like they're probably still over there. You know, I, clearly this is something that they were casing us, go, seeing us going, go in, you know, looking through, through apartment, the apartment window, whatever, like we could probably still find this yeah. you know, stuff. And, and he, he just looked at me and, you know, with the most positive voice and he was such a positive person. He said, he goes, you know, he goes, he goes, just let it go. He goes, we're lucky enough that we can get new things for somebody to, break into a car while we were in church and know that we were in church in a church parking lot, they are clearly down on their luck more than, more than we can ever know. So what we need to do is pray for them and hope that they, they're able to get back on their feet. Wow. And, and for me to see that, like, you know, and, and not just, you know, a, a dad imparting that, you know, on the son, you know, just with words, but literally living it out in the moment um, is something that, you know, just, I think about a lot. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm very proud to be his son, uh, very proud, you know, that, that he was, is my father and, uh, you know, will continue to live on through, through me and, and, and my children and, and my family. Yeah. That's a wonderful story. Um, I guess not every kid too gets a chance to <clears throat> grow up with a dad who's a coach in the NBA and the guy that he's coaching is a future hall of famer in Kevin. Yeah. I figured you would have at least one story. <laughs> PG rated, I yeah, know, yeah, stuff with KG, uh, but a PG rated maybe story that you remember from, from Kevin Garnett and the big ticket. Yeah, I mean, he, I was fortunate, I was so fortunate to, um, 
be around guys like like Kevin, be around guys like Sam Cassell, who I actually ended up working with in Washington as an assistant with the Wizards, yeah. who was one of, a close friend to to this day. Um, Sam Mitchell, who you know I remember sitting and listening to him, you know, tell stories in the locker room, uh, and uh, and you know I worked for Sam for a year after my dad had passed. Yeah. So I, I'm really fortunate to have a lot of people in my life who are help help shape. Um, I like to think the man I've become that, you know, I'm continuing to work, you know, to become a better man, but somebody that, that I'm, I'm proud, um, proud to be at the, at the moment. Uh, you know, w- one thing about Kevin is he is fierce, fiercely loyal. And uh, I was always a very, very um, quiet kid. And he was always great about, you know, just allowing, I was a ball boy and, you know, I, I just kind of came in and did my job. And, and my dad always told me, Hey, do your job. And, you know, you don't need to talk a whole lot, you know, just get in and do what you got to do. And, and we always, Kevin and I always kind of bonded even since I was little. And, uh, you know, so as I got older, you know, he, and he was great about, you know, sharing knowledge on every topic you can imagine, you know, (laughs) some I won't share here, but I I mean, as a young man, you know, going through a lot of things, he gave me advice on a lot of, a lot of different things. Sure. Um, but then, you know, then as, as I, I got to high school, I was about to turn 16. He, uh, you know, he was, well, as, as I, in high school, he was so great about, you know, he knew I wanted to, you know, was continuing to become a better basketball player and I want to continue to grow. And he used to like to work out in the summertime, you know, in the middle of the night, basically. So he, you know, Hey, come down and, and, you know, rebound for me. And then he rebound for me 15 for 15 minutes. And, you know, it's, it's a hall of famer rebounding for, you know, 15, 16 year old kid that, that like, he didn't need to do that. Right. But he was just fiercely loyal to people that, you know, he connected with. And then my last kind of example of that is when I was about to turn 16, I remember him telling me, and then he told my dad too, which I'll get to, you know, for Ryan's 16th birthday, you know, Rhino, he called, always called me Rhino for Rhino's 16th birthday. I want to give him my aqua green, aquamarine green Porsche. <laughs> and wow. me, I'm a six, I'm a 16 year old. And I'm like, I'm like, this is awesome. I, yeah. Like I'll take that. And so my dad, he told my, he's telling me, KG's telling me all about it in the training room. And I'll never forget. My dad walks in and KG's like, Hey Rhino, I'm a, or Hey Flip, I'm gonna give Rhino my, my Porsche for his birthday next week. And my dad's like, no, you're not. He's like, he's like, you're not doing that. And I'm like, why not? And KG's the same thing. He's like, why not? <laughs> and my dad's like, you're not getting a Porsche for your first car. Right. And, you know, in my heart in that moment, I knew not to, you know, kind of fight back at it. And in my heart, I'm like, oh, he just wants it to be a surprise type of thing. It's, it's, you know, and then next week, great car, got a lot of mileage out of it. I loved it. Um, I get a used Nissan Xterra, um, which was a great car, great yeah. car but it was not that green Porsche. And, <laughs> but to, to this day, to this day, it's a great lesson. I'm really glad that my dad, you know, it was always, you know, whether people want to believe that or not, you know, I know people can have conception, misconceptions about, you know, coaches, kids in a lot of ways. And I know everyone is different, but my dad, he really did believe, you know, Hey, you work for everything you get. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and, and that's something that stuck with me a lot. Take me to uh, – that's a great story. I love that, by the way. I wonder where that yeah. Porsche is today, by the way. That would be fun to find yeah. out. Does KG yeah. still have it sitting in, you know, sitting in the in the probably the gigantic garage that he has? Yeah, yeah. hopefully he's got on. my name on it. But. <laughs> <laughs> someday, someday, Ryan, right? Someday. Um, let me ask you about – because you eventually become the head coach, which is such yeah. a cool thing with Minnesota. I remember I said the wrong year, too. I think you were 32. <laughs> When you became oh, a coach, I, I think I said 33 at the conference we were at, 32, yeah. though, uh, which was the youngest coach at that time, I believe, in the NBA. Um, mm-hmm. But then it doesn't work out, and you don't have yeah. all the wins, and you don't win a title, and it's suddenly you're not with the franchise that you yeah. were a part of for many years, you know, since you were a little kid, basically. Yeah. Take me through the, the, the lessons learned and maybe yeah. a little bit of the positives, even though people will look at it and say, oh, it was a disaster. You didn't win any games, blah, blah, blah. But you said you learned a lot of positives oh, yeah. from that time to help you now where you where you are. So what was that experience? Yeah, yeah and I think anytime you get let go from a job in sports, um, mm-hmm. people, if, if, if you didn't win a, a lot of games, like I, the NBA, you know, sports, they go in cycles. Teams, organizations go in cycles. 
you didn't win a lot of games. People are going to say that's a failure. Right. To me, that was not that was not a failure because what I was I was brought in there during that time for a specific reason, and and people who I feel are not believers will never understand that. Um, but you know, we there were a lot of things away from the court that um, I felt very not proud, but I felt mm. that I was needed to be a part of players' lives, people within the organization, their lives. Sure. Um, I felt, I felt, you know, we had a ton of injuries during that time. I, you know, I, I grew up in a no excuse household, um, but you know, reality is reality too, you know, <laughs> and we had a ton of injuries at that time. It really helped shape me and understanding that sometimes things are out of your control. Um, sometimes, you know, people might not have the same, I guess, mindset or goal or, or plan as you may have. And you got to understand that you, maybe you need to do a better job setting boundaries, but you also need to do a better job of not just, you know, being a partner and accepting things, but also pushing back when the time is right. Um, I learned that, but I also, um, as I got around the nuggets, I, I, I learned too, you know, we weren't that far off in terms of the approach. Um, it just didn't, didn't translate, you know, in ways that, you know, people would judge, you know, success in sports. Yeah. Um, yeah. So to me, it, it was not a failure. To me, it was a, a, a period of player development. And I think you can look now at, you know, a lot of guys who have developed um, in the right way. And my dad always had a great line. He said, you can't develop and win at the same time. Mm. And, and I think that's a, that's a very truthful, um, truthful statement in a sense of, you know, if you're, if you're really developing for the future and you're trying to develop your young players, they're going to need playing time. And with that comes, you know, learning experiences, growing pains and uh, you know, plenty of things I could have done a lot better. Uh, but plenty of things I'm very proud of uh, having been in Minnesota and I'm, I'm happy that, you know, they have some good things going. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, it was good to see a lot of those guys during the playoff run, you know, not just on the court, but, you know, people within that organization that I uh, still keep in touch with. So, um, you know, there were a lot, a lot of lessons learned, you know, some negative, but a lot of positive. Yeah, it probably changed your definition of success, I would imagine, a little bit too, because you can win a title and everybody's going to say, okay, Ryan Saunders, NBA yeah. champion coach. But I've talked to a lot of people where they say, man, if success is defined by wins and losses, I, I've I, obviously that's what the gauge is in terms of you keeping a job. You need, yeah, yeah. but from a long-term perspective or even from an off the court perspective, I would imagine your definition of success is a little different. Oh, definitely. And, and, you know, success, I think, you know, progress, progress is a word I'd rather use. Mm. Um, Cause if, if you're, you're progressing, you know, each day um, that's gonna, going to lead to, ultimate success, whatever that looks like. And, and however you define that. and in your faith too, and, uh, right? in your faith. In your, exactly. And, and that, that's, that's right where I was going in the sense of, you know, my year off, I ended up taking a year off and just being a dad, being a husband, um, which was great in Minnesota, difficult in some ways. Um, but, it, but it was great where I was able to one, get perspective, but I was also able to progress and, and find the value in progressing um, and the process of that, on a daily basis. And I, you know, I, I picked, you know, four, basically four categories for, for myself, faith, family, um, finances, which, you know, I, I and when I say finances, I, I equate that to my job. Mm -hmm. So becoming better in my job. So I, I picked four F's and then fitness, you know, becoming, you know, being somebody who wanted, wanted to get in, you know, better shape and, and, you know, both mentally and physically. But, you know, with that, I tried to attack all those areas on a daily basis um, and find ways to, you know, whether it be, hey, finish the Bible in a year, which I was able to do at that time. Um, able to, hey, I got an hour of present time with my, with my, uh, with my kids, you know, where there's nothing else. It ended up turning into more, more than one hour because I learned very quickly when you're not working in the NBA and you can't give people jobs, your phone doesn't ring as much, which is really weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, there were some days where that phone didn't come off the charger. So, um, which is, which is funny, but, uh, but yeah. then, then, you know, just the progress aspect of it all is something that I learned to find value in. Yeah, that's good. I like those F's. Those are all important F's. Um, let me ask you as we wind down the last question, about that first F, the faith, right? What are you, what are you learning from God now? Where you've kind of had this perspective yeah. on seeing the journey He's taken you on, 
you know, and the coaching and, and the losses, uh, both yeah. personally with family members and your father, but also losses on the court, but even the wins now. What's the lesson God is teaching you right now when you look at your life? You know, just, just being steadfast in, in a belief, in the belief that things will work out the way he wants them to work out. And it's not going to be on, on our time timeline, um, you know, the way that we, we or, or in a way that we see them working out. Um, I, I say that in a sense of, you know, I, I can, you can look and I, I believe in goal setting. I think it's really, really important, but I also think it's important to understand that if you set your goals high, obviously, you know, you want to attain them. You want to, you know, <laughs> you want to get to that point. Um, if you, if you really want to attain those goals, you're going to have to en endure a lot of trials. And it's, it's just about, you know, not giving up and not giving up on your faith. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I say that in this, with leaving you with this, I, you know, you asked me to start this conversation about, you know, what it felt like to win an NBA championship and uh, you know, what, you know, when it kind of hits you, I, one of the, my wife, my now wife, we're going to be celebrating six years um, this coming weekend here. We yeah. have two beautiful kids, um, four-year-old, two-year-old. We have a great marriage. We built a great life that we, we're very proud of. Um, she was somebody that I met in college. Um, she was a much smarter woman then, didn't want to date me in college. She probably knew I needed a little bit of time. Um, <laughs> but then, you know, as adult life kind of kind of got going, um, we reconnected a little bit when I moved back to Minnesota. But um, in that time, you know, she I had to wear her down a little bit. Well, when she agreed to go out with me it was basically a week after my dad had passed. Mm. And to me, that was my dad, you know, kind of pushing her saying, hey, this is you, you got to go save him. We ended up get, getting married. And I, on one of our first dates, she asked me what one of my, my lifelong career goals is. And I told her early on, I knew she was the one I told her early on. I said, I want to look up in the stands and see you after winning an NBA championship. Wow. And. I was able to, to do that, and uh, the path wasn't one that was that was an ultimate goal of mine. Now, um, the path wasn't one that I thought um, I'd ever be able to kind of navigate my way through. But with faith, I was able to, and um, you know, and here here I stand, and um, <laughs> in, in, in a in a way that uh, I feel very very blessed and grateful for. That's a great story. Her name's Haley, right? Haley, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's the real MVP, yeah. right? As as Kevin oh. Durant once said. <laughs> oh, it's unbelievable. What what pe people don't understand what what wives, what husbands, what you know, kids, um, what any family member, what they give up. And I understand. You know, we see the the you know ESPN broadcasts and the nice outfits and everything, and we see the money and the nice cars, but. You know there is a lot given up too, so you know with that, um, you know the families give up a lot. So in the off season, you try to, you know, you really do try to spend time, um, be present, and uh, create memories with them. Yeah, that's which awesome. we're about to go get some ice cream. So that, there you go. Memory. That's a good memory right there. Hopefully, yeah. it's uh, maybe a little chocolate chip cookie dough, Ryan. What are you getting? If you well, get you, you you know the area a little bit, uh, little man ice cream out here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Little man ice cream. So. Great, great salted, uh, salted Oreo or salted peanut butter cup. Oh my! Um, yeah. So we're 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 big fans. Yeah. Well, I might need to cut this interview short so I can go get some ice cream too, Ryan. There you go. There you go. <laughs> hey man, thanks for your time. Thanks so much. Yeah, for absolutely. This. And uh, I'm glad we're connected, and I hope we can uh, for sure connected, and I'll, hopefully I'll have you back on the show soon. Let's do it again. All right. All right. Thanks, Jason. Thanks so much for watching today on Sports Spectrum. Make sure you click that subscribe button so you don't miss any other videos. And if you want more stories on sports and faith, check out our website, sportsspectrum.com.